Welcome to The Infinite Jungle, the podcast about the evolution of Ethereum. I'm your host, Christine Kim, VP of Research at Galaxy, and this is the second episode of the show. I want to give a huge thanks and shout out to everyone who tuned in for the trailer of the show last week and tuned into the first episode. I've been watching everybody's reactions and feedback on the show, and it's made me really pleased to hear about how excited people are for this series. I need to remind you to please refer to the disclaimer linked in the podcast show notes and note that none of the information in this podcast constitutes investment advice, an offer, recommendation, or solicitation by Galaxy Digital or any of its affiliates to buy or sell any securities. Um, today on the show, we're going to be summarizing All Core Developer Execution Call, ACDE, uh, number 180, and we're also going to be inviting on two very special guests who are extremely knowledgeable about Ethereum staking. We're going to have ETH staker Nixo and uh, crypto manufacturers Torsten on the show for the second half. Um, but to start off, let's do what we normally do <laughs> or what we're going to normally do on these shows to kick us off and summarize the latest ACD call. We're recording this on Friday, so a day after the call has happened. These calls usually happen on Thursdays. Um, this is ACDE 180. Um, I'm not going to go in order of how everything was shared um, according to the agenda. If you want the full summary, you know, going line item by line item for what was talked about. Um, be sure to check out the summary, the write-up of the summary um, on galaxy.com. Um, you can find the the full thing posted there. Um, I'm just going to give quick highlights and, and go over first kind of my takes on what I thought was the most in interesting parts of the call. Um, first up was uh, Denku updates. Um, there was the Sepolia hard fork that happened last Tuesday, um, January 30th, and developers gave a little bit of a debrief on how the Denkun hard fork went. There really wasn't much to share. <laughs> it was like one sentence from um, Perry, who's a EF um, Ethereum Foundation Dev DevOps engineer, and he basically said it went fine. You know, it was a pretty uneventful fork. Um, the upgrade went smoothly which is good news and also news that was different from when the fork, when the upgrade had been activated on the prior testnet, Gorily. Uh, there had been some issues on chain, um, some disruptions to the network. So it was a little bit of a relief to see how well the upgrade went on Sepolia. Um, nothing out of the ordinary, almost, to speak of. Um, so developers are going to be now upgrading the third and final Ethereum testnet, <laughs> public testnet. Uh, Holsky tomorrow, when, well, it's Friday. I'm recording this on Friday, but it, the podcast is going to come out Tuesday. And basically the upgrade happens on Wednesday. Um, so by the time you guys are listening to this, um, the upgrade is going to be happening the day after. On Wednesday, February 7th, this will be the last test public testnet to be upgraded before Ethereum mainnet. So developers are really kind of getting to the end of the testing cycle for this upgrade. And um, lots of anticipation for when exactly Denkun is going to hit, hit mainnet. I still have a lot of conviction that it's probably going to happen um, in March, but uh, developers agreed on ACDE 180 to actually decide when the mainnet fork date is going to be on the next ACD call, which is ACDC... Uh, I don't know exactly what number, but basically next week's call after the whole ski upgrade goes ahead, which developers um, presumably are thinking that it's going to go pretty smoothly. They want to be able to set the date for mainnet um, on Thursday, February the 8th. Um, so it's a really tight turnaround and developers could potentially schedule out the mainnet activation date three weeks from there, which would put the upgrade basically at the end of this month, end of February. I think that's it could happen, but that's still a very tight turnaround. Um, that's also around the time when ETH Denver is going to happen, which is, um, I believe, North America is one of North America's largest Ethereum developer conferences. Um, so it may be that 
to try and kind of avoid that conference time. Developers kind of push it out um, to sometime in early March. But of course, these are all just kind of predictions of what may or may not happen. Developers going to be talking about when to schedule the mainnet activation on the next ACD call. So it'll be a pretty exciting one to watch. Um, I will highlight, though, about some of the things that developers are looking at um, in terms of the Denkun upgrade. Um, two things that were pretty noteworthy. One of the Nethermind developers had said that they have been, they're trying to investigate a bug um, that's causing the blob mempool to grow beyond the limits that it has. Um, they noticed that when they started spamming um, one of the dev nets, which is like um, kind of a closed test network just for developers, when they started spamming DevNet 12, uh, they noticed that uh, validator participation rates dropped by more than 20%. So they're looking into it. They're not sure exactly what's going on, but um, they're going to try and do further testing on not just DevNet 12, but Gorley as well, which went through the Denkun upgrade. Um, and then the second kind of thing to note about what developers are still looking at as it relates to the Denkun upgrade is what the prison team is investigating. The prison team said that they noticed some unusual activity regarding a late block proposal on the Sepolia testnet um, that didn't include any blob transactions when I guess it was supposed to include those blob tr transactions. So two kind of items that need to be dug into further, investigated further. And if it does prove to be um, an issue across clients that needs updating, that needs fixing um, across more than one client, then I can see that also delaying the upgrade on mainnet. So something to keep an eye out for. We'll get more details on it on the next ACD call. Um, so yeah, that was really the summary um, for for the update for Denkun on yesterday's call. The most, probably the majority of the call though, was spent talking about what developers should be focusing on for the next upgrade after Denkun. Um, Prague, Prague Electra, the combined upgrade name is Pectra, I think. Um, <laughs> one of the comments on Twitter when I was talking about these upgrades, um, one of the comments on Twitter was that developers need to stop using very obscure names um, for naming these upgrades. Um, but the naming convention, I will say, and it's kind of a fun fact, is um, for the consensus layer upgrades, developers try and name the upgrades after major stars. So Electra, I believe, is the name of a constellation or a star. And then for the execution layer upgrades, they name it after major cities. So Prague is a city. The upgrade after Prague is supposedly going to be called um, Osaka. Um, I've been trying to get uh, developers to try and upgrade the next upgrade after Osaka to be Seoul, but there's quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of what you call it, support for potentially naming it after a major African city after Osaka. But anyways, not important in terms of the technical details. Let's get into a little bit of what developers talked about for Prague. Um, they discussed three major code changes, Verkle, EOF, and history expiry. If you want a little bit more detail on what these upgrades entail, um, be sure to check out the full write-up. Verkle is basically an upgrade to the way that data is structured on Ethereum to make it more efficient and um, is kind of a, a necessary precursor to what developers call statelessness, um, which is another kind of uh, major upgrade that Ethereum developers want to move towards, but they can't get to it until they upgrade and overhaul Ethereum's data structure, which is currently um, technically structured in Merkle trees, and they want to change it to Verkle trees. So this is the Verkle upgrade. They talked about Verkle. EOF is a bundle of various code changes that are all geared towards upgrading the EVM. The EVM is Ethereum's um, virtual machine. It's the, it's the part of Ethereum that is able to execute smart contract code. It's what makes Ethereum general purpose. The fact that you can so easily code um, transactions with various conditions attached to it, it's all because Ethereum has a virtual machine. Um, and the EVM, Ethereum was the very first general purpose blockchain that 
to ever exist in the world. So its virtual machine is the oldest. And there's obviously been a ton of development on general purpose computation on blockchains since 2015 when Ethereum launched. So there's quite a lot of major upgrades that developers want to make to the EVM. Um, and a lot of those code changes that would help improve the EVM functionality is called EOF. Um, the third and the last is, is history expiry. Um, this really has to do with kind of the, the size of Ethereum state growing over time as the blockchain has to keep records of just a constantly growing amount of accounts, transactions, and whatnot. History expiring me basically means that um, trying to transition uh, the network so that it stops having to serve historical block data um, on the peer-to-peer -peer layer after a certain period of time. Um, so developers really went in depth on how ready these upgrades are for potentially a prog um, upgrade and basically they decided that Verkle, while it's super important and getting kind of close to the finish line for implementation, although some developers would still suggest that by close to the finish line, they mean like it's still probably over a year out before it can really hit mainnet. They agreed that as important as Verkle is, they're gonna push Verkle off to the Osaka upgrade. So not planning it for the next immediate upgrade after Dencoon, but pushing it to Osaka. And then for the EOF upgrade, there's still quite a bit of controversy. Um, I noticed that there was quite a lot of discussion also about will EOF be um, compatible with the Verkle upgrade, which to be quite honest, I didn't quite understand um, <laughs> because during the conversation, um, a, lot of, a lot of what EOF is trying to do is kind of improve um, the way that transactions are executed on Ethereum, improve the EVM, um, and it was difficult for me to grasp kind of why Verkle would actually, why it wouldn't be compatible with something like the Verkle upgrade. EOF, there's still conversations happening around it. There wasn't a firm, you know, yes, it's going to go into Prague. No, it's not going to go into Prague. Quite a, a lot of concern that, you know, EOF should be included in Prague, but if there does appear to be some kind of a, a conflict between the EOF and the vertical upgrade, then developers should just not do EOF at all. So still more conversation to come on EOF. Um, as for the last one, history expiry, um, it turns out that a lot of the preparation work that needs to happen for history expiry um, can happen independently of a hard fork. So developers don't need to change anything about the Ethereum protocol. They have to really focus on kind of finalizing the data formats that um, an alternative peer-to-peer -peer network would be able to support um, and be able to service all this like historical block data um, so that when users are trying to access it on Ethereum um, and you know because of history expiry they can't because it's too the data is too old they can go to an alternative peer-to-peer -peer network um, called the portal network and be able to access that data so making sure that that alternative network is up and running reliable has the data in the right data format all of that work will take roughly about a year or so. So uh, developers agreed to start working on it now in parallel to you know, whatever prog ends up becoming as an upgrade. Um, so pretty good kind of progress, I would say, on, on these items. And uh, next week, developers will continue to kind of debate and hash out uh, the real scope of prog. Um, and I think now, you know, now that Verkle, it, developers have agreed Verkle is going to be in Osaka and History Expire is going to be worked on in parallel. I think the real big question to be continuing to ask is, is EOF going to be included in Prague or not? Um, and then on the consensus layer side, as I had mentioned during the, the last episode, are major items like inclusion lists and the increase to the maximum effective balance, are these code changes going to be perhaps reconsidered or re-included in Prague for um, reasons to do with with kind of like how important they are to um, Ethereum security and how important they are to Ethereum censorship resistance. So still lots of open-ended questions and, and debates still to come um, for figuring out what the next upgrade on Ethereum after Dencoon is going to look like. But I think this is a good place to kind of um, transition over to um, chatting with our guests because two of the Two of the topics on the call that I didn't, one of the topics I should say, but there were two items talked about. Um, one of the topics that I didn't get into the call, but I want to get into with Nixo and Torsen is the topic of client diversity. So the call started off with 
um, kind of a, a postmortem on a major outage that happened with Bezu nodes. Um, Bezu is an execution layer client on Ethereum, and uh, roughly about 70% of Bezu nodes had um, suddenly went offline um, on January the 6th. So it was so the beginning of the call was really talking about why that happened. And to that event, how important client diversity was to um, make sure that even if those nodes had gone offline, there were other types of execution layer clients that were still being run by nodes and still making sure that the network reached finalization. And there's also a PR. This was the second item related to, to client diversity. There was a PR that was opened on GitHub to try and uh, gather some more accurate data on what execution layer clients are being run, how diverse execution layer clients really are on Ethereum. Um, there's a, a suggestion on how to make um, how to make sourcing that data just a lot more accurate. So um, that was that's an important topic that developers are talking about, and that I think um, you know will be able to get into further with Nixo and Torsten. So let's go over and chat with them now. Thank you guys so much for joining the Infinite Jungle Pod. Thank Happy so to be here. Thanks for having us. I'm so excited to talk with you guys about Ethereum staking because. While I focus a lot on what developers are doing, and of course developers are important for, you know, thinking about how Ethereum could develop in the future and really being forward looking people, the people who keep the lights on on Ethereum day to day, the day to day people who are keeping Ethereum up and running are the validator node operators. It's the stakers. And I think you guys do not get enough appreciation for what you do for Ethereum every single day. So Nixo, Torsten, you guys are incredible. Um, and also excited to talk a little bit about how much development and how much improvement we've been seeing on a topic that both of you guys have been quite vocal on, client diversity. Mm -hmm. Developers talked about it yesterday on the call as well. Um, and it's been a major topic that um, it's been, it's always been something that people have been saying should improve, that Geth has too much of a majority. And Torsten, mm -hmm. you've talked about, you know, the biggest risk is what if there's a bug in Geth and, you know, 90% of nodes go down. Um, I was quite impressed to see certain staking, uh, major staking, staking node operators say that they're going to uh, switch away from Geth. Um, mm -hmm. But how effective do you actually think that this time around things are going to change? Because from my point of view, you know, the majority client of Geth, um, we've tried before to kind of change this, but um, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem like a problem that's really going to uh, change anytime soon, especially with the incentives that we have um, on Ethereum today. And, and social pressure, as we know, is, is kind of a very short lived. I will say there hasn't there hasn't been like a huge effort um, before maybe six months ago, and that's because there the other clients were not necessarily ready for that change um, to be to be relied on as um, as replacements for Geth uh, for a lot of large node operators. But I'll let Yorick talk about the fact that he um, runs a lot of keys, and um, we we published a blog post last year that was sort of like a okay, we're ready to start. We're ready to start pushing for execution layer diversity. Um, and so this is really like the first time that I've ever seen like the social layer engage in a way that they said, oh my god, I finally understand what this risk is because people didn't. I, I did a poll, I think like three or four months ago that said, how much could I lose in this scenario? And 25% of people who, got, who responded to the poll got it right. Mm -hmm. And so the people just really didn't understand what the risk was. And with this lo latest social layer push, I'm hopeful that people are actually taking it seriously. Because I did reach out to quite a few node operators, large node operators, uh, maybe four months ago. And I said, here's a blog post we just, we just published. Send this to your engineers. What do you need? to convince you to switch over what more data what more data can we provide and um they basically said cool thanks for the heads up we don't really have the engineering resources for this they didn't take it seriously i didn't feel like they really passed it on to their teams but um now i feel like they're taking it a little bit more seriously do york do you have anything to add i i agree with that um as we as as this latest push came to be Right. And I think it was maybe just a combination of things. Um, Nethermind and Besu had bugs in short order. Besu was not consensus impacting. Nethermind was. And 
people took the right lesson from that, which is really heartening. They didn't say, oh, Beso and Nethermind are horrible. We shouldn't be running them. They said, what if that Nethermind bug happens in Geth, right? And then um, just, a, I think, like a week before that, Sam from East Acre had said, hey, Yorick, Torsten, um, you know how you keep talking about, you know, using different clients and this risk? We don't have numbers. I said, that's a good point. So we, <laughs> we created a little spreadsheet with just like an upper bound, right, which said we can lose as a as a chain some $45 billion if this happens, some stupid amount, right? Um that's that's what that's the loss right that's the upper bound maybe not quite as bad because ACD comes up with an irregular state change to allow the minority chain to um, uh, finalize faster but whatever right so I think those two things really yeah those two things really made a difference Um, and then crypto zitter got all into it which I'm actually glad for this time around one thing I learned in this discussion, and this was ha- happening on the East Acre Discord, is the language we use was confusing. So we kept talking about client diversity, and I had a user say to me, you know, I always thought this was like charity. I'm like, charity? Why charity? Oh, because of what diversity means in the broader non-crypto culture, right? They were thinking it ha- it was a it's feel good, it was a woke <laughs> thing, it was a political thing. I'm like, no, it's about supermajority risk. And they're like, then why don't you say supermajority risk? Like, hmm, <laughs> okay, good point. <laughs> so we actually renamed our channel on the Discord to supermajority risk because that's what it's about, right? I did. I also encountered How do that. We control uh, like... the supermajority risk. Yeah, I also encountered that like three months ago, I was talking to a user on Reddit who was pushing back in the East Acre subreddit and saying like, I don't want to take on this risk. I don't want to run a minority client that's maybe less stable than Geth just for the good of the, just for some altruistic cause. And I was like, hold on a second. This isn't altruism. This is entirely a, a selfish choice for you to make. And I think that, that wasn't necessarily clear to everybody. Hmm. Right. And just for our listeners, I do want to say, um, Torsten also goes by Yorick. So when we switch around sometimes, just in terms of yeah. our listeners, we're talking about the same person. Um, <laughs> um, but I mean, going back to kind of the the conversation around uh, diversity being like a, a charged word, there definitely is an element though of altruism in the sense that if you don't genuinely think that the minority client that you're running is more you know, performant, is more secure, is at least competitive to the Geth client that you could have run. I think Mm -hmm. that it does feel like a little bit of a loss. Like if you, if you genuinely think that Geth, the likelihood of a bug being in Geth and you losing out on, you know, um, participation rewards or, you know, attestation rewards, um, because there's a higher likelihood of a bug and, you know, a more experimental client. Um, I can see why it's a little bit of a harder transition if you think the tooling and the documentation around the minority client is not as as robust as the documentation and tooling around Geth. Maybe you think that it's going to be another parity and one day it's just going to be deprecated and you're going to have to move over to another client again. Um, but Nick, so to your point, I think you were saying how like there's actually been a ton of development to bring minority clients up to the same level of competitiveness to Geth um, as of as of late. And I'm curious to know um, in terms of like continued funding and just development for making minority clients as competitive to Geth, how confident are we that like sometimes it feels like clients are a public good. It's not a, a software that like you can make a ton of money off, money off of. And of course, Geth, which is backed by Ethereum Foundation, which had the IC, okay, well, maybe I won't call it an ICO, but you know, it had it had a funding, okay? It had funding from the very beginning. Um, how, how likely is it that, you know, minority clients are finding very interesting ways to, to stay competitive, to continue its funding, and to, to make sure that what they do um, isn't just seen as like a, a public good, like a kind of like a charity, that they're a charity case, which they shouldn't be, you know, they should be as important to Ethereum as, you know, the Ethereum Foundation is and, and the products they're building. Okay, so, I'll take that then. Or do yeah. you want to take that? No, Both of you. you though. Both of you have to. <laughs> I feel like this is, 
you know, this goes into kind of future looking. Will this will this keep going? Because for me, I, even though I'm not a node operator, I would imagine that as a node operator, I would never ever switch off a of GIF if the quality of minority clients just don't continue to right. To do so that. I have so many th so many thoughts on that. Right? Um, can I start with quality before I get into funding? Um, yes. <laughs> I've been running Nethermind and Besu for one and a half years with now 10,000 keys. It performs great. These are absolutely competitive clients for staking in particular, right? On the RPC side, there's sometimes some behavior where I'm like, this is weird. And I think that comes mostly from um, historically, there wasn't an RPC spec. It was whatever Geth is doing, which is very hard to write to, right? Um, so if your application just only runs with Geth and you're using it as an RPC node, go for it, right? That's the other thing we need to say. We care about validators here. We're caring about the security of the chain and the security of your ETH that you have staked. RPC nodes do not do validation. Run whatever works with your app, right? So for staking, both Nethermind and Besu have been great. Um, the other part about, hey, it's so hard to switch, I hear you. If you're doing this now and you're creating the tooling to switch, I highly recommend, if you haven't done so already, to lean hard into IAC, infrastructure as code, and write this so that you can switch out the client with a minimum of effort. So you know, I'm gonna brag a little bit here um, we have switched out one client. We were running a third client instead of Nethermind and Besu, replaced it with Nethermind, I think complete with the quality assurance. It took us four hours total across the entire fleet. Impressive. Right? Because everything's Ansible, everything's automated. It's simple, right? Just replace, um, I'm not gonna say other client.yaml. I don't wanna rag on them too hard. Um, with Nethermind. We love ragging, we love ragging. <laughs> 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 right um so this can be done there's a lot of really smart engineers working for these large staking outfits if they take this opportunity to strengthen their iac or create it from scratch if it doesn't exist um it'll work uh the way to run these clients well is also well documented i will once more offer because I want to protect my own bags, I am happy to give anyone who has a large staking outfit 15 to 30 minutes of my time free of charge to just chat and say, these are the parameters we're running it with. This is how it's been working for us. Right. Um, just so that, and I say protecting my own bags, because if this worst case scenario comes to happen or comes to pass, all Ethereum suffers, whether you're staking or not staking, whether you're just holding it, it doesn't matter. The impact is truly catastrophic and we don't want to be there. So funding. Um, I don't know where Nethermind are getting their money from, but they're not just doing the client. So they seem to be fine. I'm not their, worried. Their, that... client team, their client team is actually very small compared to the, the bulk um, of right. the Nethermind team in general. They do a lot of things in the ecosystem and they're like, they're, they're a very large team with a very small client. Um, I am not worried team. that consensus is running out of money anytime soon. <laughs> and I'm not worried that paradigm is running out of money. Yeah. I'm not worried that paradigm is running out of money anytime soon. That's the ref client right, which is coming up fast. Um, I've been very impressed with how stable they already are in alpha. I'm really looking forward to them going general availability sometime after Denkun. Um, yeah. And this is the other part, like why why do people do this, right? Sorry, Nix, just one more no, thought. No, that's exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> Go like, for it. Why do they do this, right? Paradigm doesn't build Wrath out of the goodness of their heart. They're building it sure? because they wanna be at the, I'm pretty sure. They're building it because they want to be <laughs> at the table, right? Mm -hmm. And to be at the yep. table, they had a choice. They could have done like, uh, I forget which layer two bought Prism. They could have been done, done, done that and bought a team, or they could have said, we're just building another client. And they chose to tackle the hard, the really hard one, which is an execution layer client, which I give them a lot of kudos for to do this from scratch, right? Okay. Um, that's, that's the hard one. And, um, 
that gives them a seat at the table. That gives them a seat in ACD, right? This, this is valuable to them. They're a VC and they want that seat at the table within Ethereum. That's, that's how I see it. Nix, go ahead. Um, another thing I wanted to harp on is you were talking about like, what if one of the client, um, one of the client, the client, the minority client that we choose is deprecated, goes down in crypto. I think that we're very used to having, um, startups operate a bunch of things. And so we, we expect less of them, but in terms of like right now, the, the protocols that are running your stake, you should absolutely be expecting the most from. So in terms of risk mitigation, when, when they say, what is the risk of this other client having a bug or not getting um, maybe as many attestations or their effectiveness not being as high, they should be factoring the catastrophic risk that there is in the very small um, chance. And if they're not taking the whole picture of your uh, risk profile into account when they talk to you about this or when they, when they make decisions about their architecture, I would be concerned about that. I would also be concerned about a team who says, well, we don't want to switch in the case that a client gets deprecated because that means that the engineering team has no backup plan and they mm. should always have a backup plan, no matter if they're running the super majority client, the super stable client or not. If they're not comfortable switching execution layer clients, I would already be concerned about this team. And like people who stay yeah. with an operation who says, oh, we run Geth and only Geth because it's the most stable client. I would say, well, if there's ever a bug, I know that my stake is screwed because you guys have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I will say, Nixo, when you had posted on Twitter, like the exact template of what message or email you should write to your staking provider to ask them these hard questions. I thought that was such a perfect way to make it as easy as possible for people who might not have a technical background, but are relying on more technical people to kind of do this risk management for them to follow up. Um, and I will reemphasize again, the offer that York made um, on this pod for large stakers to, to get a little bit of his time, 15 to 30 minutes for free, you guys. That's a, that's a big offer. His time is valuable. <laughs> um, but yeah, and also, I, I, I mean, um, York, to your point of, of having like a seat at the table, we cannot discount how, how much of a, a, a value that is for client teams that are building execution layer clients, consensus layer Absolutely. clients, to have a seat at the table. Um, I would also say that given the the nature of the Denkun upgrade, I'm quite surprised at how L2s and roll-up teams don't really seem to have as big of a voice on these calls. Um, the developers mm -hmm. were saying yesterday, you know, we really need more feedback from L2s on how this upgrade, which is for L2s, are going to be working for L2s. Um, right? So for yeah. You guys, I mean, from the perspective of the staking community, you guys had a huge seat at the table for Shanghai. That being the first upgrade that happened after the merge, when a ton of other priorities could have made it in. I thought the staking community really made their voice heard. We need to get withdrawals in. Is there a similar push in the Ethereum staking community to get certain EIPs in for Prague? I know Dan Kuhn was kind of commandeered by the L2s, but really their, their voice, I, mean, I don't know where it is right now, but like staking, I'm wondering if the staking community is really going to stand up to say like, we need maximum effective balance now, or like, you know, um, what is kind of your guys' view on, on what are the EIPs that need to be prioritized for, for Prague? So I think the two EIPs that I would like to see included, I think that definitely not both of them are going to be included, um, but maybe not even maybe not even either of them um, are inclusion lists and max max effective balance. Um, max effective balance because I think that it it really helps solo stakers in the ability to um, compound their rewards, which is a huge reason to stake with a big organization right now. Because once you get anything over 32, you're not compounding that. You just kind of have to hold on to that until you can get to another 32, which takes a really long time if you only have one validator. Um, inclusion list is, I think, equally as important, but um, I think that it should be viewed as sort of like a larger ecosystem problem because I think we have one builder that's not censoring right now. And so if that one builder decides to censor, we're in a in a unprecedented place where homestakers are like the 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 ones who are really holding up the the censorship resistance of the network, um, and more more of this it, responsibility should be on more than just homestakers. Yeah, it's a really bad look. I think even right now for Ethereum and its censorship resistance, um, it's not talked about enough and. 
it's a little bit embarrassing, but anyways. <laughs> um, I'm actually thinking that the, the, the one I care most about is EIP 7002, the um, one that allows you to exit with the withdrawal address. Um, it has a bunch of advantages, obviously for large pools, because they now no longer can be held over a barrel by their node operators, right? Um, that is good. It, I think it also can simplify um, things for home stakers. One of the things we see that is most difficult for people is to keep their mnemonics safe. So they could potentially change their entire um, setup process to say, I'm creating these keys and I have a withdrawal address set from the word go. That's absolutely crucial. Don't forget that part. And then I throw away this mnemonic. I no longer care about it. If I need to withdraw or exit, I use my Ethereum wallet for that, which I am already securing as everybody does, right? So um, I think that that is a good thing to do. Beyond that, I'm actually really keen on EOF. Uh, EVM object format. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it's mostly because I think this will really bring um, value to the uh, user layer, to the uh, smart contracts. It will be easier to write bigger smart contracts um, because Ethereum can safely increase the size of these. It will be easier to reason about security because we have a separation of data and code. You know, overall, this is a good thing. And um, the sooner we have that in, so developers can start using it, which on their end is really probably just, you know, um, one check mark in their compiler of choice. Nothing really changes from a code perspective. It just you end up with code that's easier to reason about. Um, I think that's really valuable. And for stakers, anything that helps the Ethereum ecosystem helps stakers. We all are holders of relatively large amounts of ETH. Yeah. You know? If you want fees, if you want, you know, MEV rewards, you're going to have to attract more users and if issuance I, is not looking. Yeah. And if yeah. I want my 32 ETH to be worth 2x at some point or even more, you know, yay the moon, um, then I need. I, I need the ecosystem, I need the users to start using ETH so it gains in value, right? That's true. I mean, I, unfortunately, though, it does, I think there's a, quite a lot of controversy and pushback um, to including EOF into the prog upgrade. And even more so, I would say, for inclusion list and max effective balance, saying that these are just, they might delay the upgrade, it's too complex. Um, mm. the, the voice of developers, I think, are very keen on, they're not always aligned with the interest of Ethereum users or the interest of Ethereum stakers or the interest of perhaps even L2 roll-up teams and what should be prioritized for an upgrade. Um, how, how important do you think it is that, you know, m more people from the Ethereum staking community, more pe more stakeholders from the Ethereum community outside of core developers show up at these calls and start petitioning for some of these upgrades to be included. I think it's it's almost a little bit taboo on, in Ethereum, it feels like, to go against the will of core developers. But I'm wondering, you know, given that you guys just shared, you know, some of the, the code changes you'd like to see, and I'm letting you know that I'm listening on these calls and it doesn't look great for these code changes and their inclusion for Prague, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what is what is your thinking behind this? I, I wish that more home stakers would take an interest in stuff like this. And I think that things like your podcast starting will really help because people have a lot of trouble digesting everything that goes to the all core devs call. I know mm -hmm. when I go through the all core devs call, I kind of, I put it on in the background. I tune in and out of it sometimes because there's a lot that's happening. There's conversation, there's back and forth. There's some stuff I don't care about. Um, and so stuff like that gives you the high level is really, really helpful. But when it comes to things that benefit home stakers, there's really no one there at the call to advocate for this home staking majority or minority. Um, and so there are a lot of people trying to get seats whose jobs depend on it, who are mm. well funded to be lobbying for it. And so stakers really don't have anyone who um, is at that table. And so I think it's really important for people to go and try to make their voice heard. 
Um, but it's always hard to get people um, super involved in like the, the real technical consensus like yeah. research. And, and I think that's the risk, right? We want to be a little careful that um, we don't have Nick's showing up and saying, I am homestakers, right? I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm pointing fingers at you, Nick's. I, I, I'd be the same thing, right? Or anybody, Butter, you know, Sam Colfax, or the Eve Staker, Staker crew. We don't speak for homestakers. We, we really can't, right? And so what I notice is the same kind of energy you had with miners you have with validators, which is they're really not focused on protocol things, right? When you think back to um, fee burn, uh, EIP 1559, um, it was being discussed for years. I think literally like six years is how long it took. And then six months before it went into a hard fork, when all was said and done, then the miners got all about it, like, wait, ho hold up, you know, you're going to burn what? So <laughs> I, I, you know, if, if you're a, a solo staker and listening to this, I encourage you to read Kim's uh, tweets every week that done an absolute amazing job of summing up what's happening in ACD. I, I rely on this. I don't listen to ACD. Huh? I, I outed myself just now. I don't. Uh, it's rare. Sometimes I'll go in and I'll scrub to somewhere to hear a little bit more. I did actually this time, and I I still feel hopeful for EOF from what I saw in the chat notes and so on. It doesn't didn't seem to be a ton of pushback on that idea. Um, we'll see next time the talk, right? Um, but yeah, I encourage you to you know, take those five, 10 minutes every week, uh, seek out Kim's Twitter and uh, read the read the the too long didn't watch, which is always amazing. And then, you know, just see what you care about. Yeah, 100%. No, I appreciate that. And I got to say, wow, what a wild time when miners were at the table and vying for, you know, what code changes and what, what code changes not to go into upgrades. That really was a wild time in Ethereum. Um, and still more wild times to come. Um, so for sure. thank you so much, Nixo um, and Torsten, for, for joining me on Infinite Jungle, telling me about your thoughts on client diversity, on Prague. I am very looking forward to how Prague scoped out will will end up looking like. Um, we're going to have to have both of you guys back on because one of the topics we didn't touch on today, but I do want to get into with you guys, is also the topic of centra stake centralization. Um, uh, and as we talk about um, kind of the, the growth of staking pools, um, and I'm sure by the time we chat again, maybe there'll be more developments on eigenlayers, so we can talk about that. Lots to get into, um, but maybe as kind of like a fun final question for Ethereum for people who are, are very into Ethereum culture, what's um, one of the Ethereum conferences that you guys know you are definitely going to and are very looking forward to this year? Because for people listening, Ethereum has like a hundred conferences every it does. year. And some of the most, the most obscure places in the world. Mm -hmm. You would not believe. But anyways, <laughs> um, maybe starting off with Nick. So uh, what's the conference that you're most looking forward to? DevCon, definitely DevCon. I it was my favorite conference um, last DevCon, and uh, it's it's such a high quality conference. They last last time they did like the public goods booths. They every talk felt really valuable and not shilly at all. Everybody I met there was a builder, or developer, or doing something great for the ecosystem. Um, and I've never been to Thailand, so I'm ex excited for uh, Bangkok. Love that. Tristan. I'm definitely going to be at FCC. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, it's in Berlin this year, right? Brussels. Brussels. Brussels? Okay. Yes. yes. Not in Paris. <laughs> Not in Paris. <laughs> it's in Brussels. Okay. I, I can see I'm not paying attention, but I'm looking forward to it. Um, I really hope I can sample Bangkok. Talent has a bill on the table this year again to allow people like me to remain married when they're coming across the border. So if that happens, I'll be there. If it doesn't happen, I won't. I have a very strict rule that I only travel where the moment I step over the border, I'm still a married man. So mm, love that. 
your partner your partner should be proud um, <laughs> um amazing well thank you guys so much again um and thank you to people who have listened in for the second episode of infinite jungle um we are going to be back next week of course um for this series doing another you know summary of the of the acd calls and talking again going a little bit deeper into ethereum ecosystem stuff um it was a pleasure to be able to go into ethereum staking and talk a little bit more about the staking what's going on with the staking community with nixo and um, yorick today and um, if you liked and enjoyed this episode please be sure to like the episode <laughs> and subscribe to the show and do you know comment do your thing um it's been a real pleasure to see kind of the the feedback from the show from last week's episode from the first episode so um yes so please keep it up everybody who's listening um and i'll see you guys all again next week for another thanks episode for having us thank you for having oh, us oh yes of course <laughs> bye guys bye